So I'm Chris Carlson. I'm a research scientist uh, at BrainChip, and we're a small startup company. And we're trying to do uh, neuromorphic computing and AI. We're trying to build systems and actually make money doing it. Okay, so that's <laughs> the novelty. Um, so I'm going to talk about Akita, which is our low-power neuromorphic uh, system on a chip for event-based computation. Okay, and I should mentioned that this is uh, you know, ongoing R&D stuff, so it's subject to change. Um, we've made a lot of progress, but uh, you know, things could always change. So, all right. All right, so uh, I was really fortunate to have everyone up here talking about giving me a lot of ideas here, because um, we're talking about a convergence between um, machine learning and uh, neuromorphic computing that, that was mentioned. And this is exactly kind of what we're trying to what we're trying to do here. So let's talk about edge computing. This is where we're talking about, OK, you're going to, you, you put compute where data is, generate, uh, data is generated. And it has a lot of applications like you know, smart homes, transportation, energy management, these types of things. Uh, and the possible benefits are you know, reduction in um, power, latency, communication requirements, and then increased security and privacy. Okay, so that's kind of, you know, uh, what a lot of people are going for. So, a popular thing that you want to do, or people often try to do, is you take a DNN and you want to put it there. You want to put it there to do either sp speech recognition or image classification or anomaly detection, uh, facial detection, all these things. Um, and here's the thing, DNNs are, are great at creating multi-level representations using automated feature extraction. In fact, they're kind of better than almost anything, OK? Because if you look at a lot of other things, they, it's really hard to compete against DNNs. But there's a challenge here. Actually, there's multiple challenges. And the idea is, um, first off, you've got to train these DNNs. And we know this takes a while. It's kind of expensive. Um, there's a lot of research now in, exp in being able to kind of take a train network and then train off of that in a smaller subset. Uh, there's also a ton of these things are pretty big, so they have memory requirements. Picture some of these big ones, ResNets, 224, whatever these are. These are huge. Um, they have power, you know, pretty intense power requirements and computational requirements. And of course, adaptability is tough. So like, once you've trained it, you put it there. It's doing inference, but then what? How do you get it to learn? Okay. And finally, these things not, are not built with event-based computing in mind, which isn't necessarily bad. But if you have an event-based sensor, then you're really going to want to use something with it. So if you have a DDS camera or something like this. OK, so when we're playing with our uh, design ideas, uh, we kept these in mind. And so here, here's what our design goals were. Okay, So we want to use a single low power hardware platform to run conventional DNN inference algorithms. That means <coughs> these algorithms that people are already familiar with and already use. Okay? But on the same chip, we want to be able to do native SNNs, native spiking neural networks, and a subset of event-based algorithms. Okay, so this is a challenge. Okay, this is something that we're interested in doing, and this is what we're trying to do to get people to, to, to use the chip in, in both, both ways. Now, I'm talking about being able to, we want this thing to be able to adapt as well. So we're talking about uh, on chip, unsupervised learning algorithms. We want to at least be able to do something like this. Okay, and finally, we want the entire, the entire network or algorithm to run on the Akita, not just. Uh, so, so that the host passes it the data, and it can do all the computations and spit out the answer at the end. OK, so maybe a different idea would be if it were an accelerator, and uh, then you'd be kind of more limited by the host speed or the host's ability to call things. So this is, these are the, those are the uh, kind of main things that we had in mind when we were designing this. So there's two additional goals that are pretty important as well, though. OK, one is we want to use well-known machine learning ecosystems for development, because OK, if everyone's using this one thing, let's say Python or TensorFlow or Keras, and you're saying, well, why don't you try this? They're going to be like, no, I'm not going to try that um, at all. 
Um, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. They'll, they'll, some of them will try it, and that's good because we want we need new things. It's true, but it's really hard to get people to adopt from a system that's really big. Okay, and uh, so we want to try to use the, the, these already existing systems because again, this is a, we're, this is not uh, a research ship per se. You can do research ship research on it, but we have to sell this. <laughs> okay, so you have to figure out how to make people you know allow people to use it for things they want. Um, and finally, we want to implement a small set of useful computational operations. So the scale of things that we're implementing is it's, it's much, it's, it's a smaller scale than what Luigi or um, uh, True North or the, and them are doing. Those things are they're fantastic research chips, and you can do a lot of really cool things that you could do. Uh, you could do a lot of cool things with them that you can't do with us. The design decision was to choose a smaller set and make them very efficient. Okay. And so, not that Louis He or True North aren't efficient in what they do, I'm, they, they definitely are. It's just we're, we're using a smaller set of things. And I'll kind of explain a little bit in more detail. Um, OK. So, so here's, here's the, the, the system on the chip. You have a, a ton of inputs here. Let's see here, does this thing it did work? OK, whatever. Uh, we, have, we have a bunch of inputs here. I'm not a hardware guy, so I don't know what all these inputs are. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> or rather, used to work out. No worries. Uh, so anyway, so we so here we have a bunch of inputs here. We could take, you know, USB 3.0, PCI. Oh, thank you. Let's see here. Oh, great. Thanks. We also have a uh, ARM Cortex M4 on here to do. Well, I guess we could, we could do a little bit of pre-processing if we need to. We could do a few other things, uh, housekeeping things on, on this. The real heavy lifting is here. Um, so we're talking about we have two different versions of, of spike encoding. Okay, So we, we're, we're going to do the spike encoding for you. You can do a little bit of it, but we're going to end up doing a, a, um, a lot of it on, on here. Okay, and We're going to save some save power by doing it. We also have, this is where the magic happens. This is where we have some neural cores and uh, this neural mesh where we pass around these packets of information. Uh, OK. So this is, oh, and of course, we have memory as well. Um, we, you don't need to use the external DDR memory. You, we have on-chip memory. You could fit a lot of cool things on here. OK. So here are, the, here are the two different applications for this thing. So first is, this idea of converting convolutional neural networks to spiky neural networks, OK? And the point is to do efficient CNN inference, OK? And what we're hoping is we can, we can leverage existing things like TensorFlow and, and Keras, and you could run an, a, a more efficient version, a quantized version, of your network on Akita, OK? And I'll talk about the two examples we have for that. And then, of course, we have the second example, which is, I think, kind of a little more interesting to uh, the neuromorphic computing people here. So this is doing native spiking neural networks. And um, we have an interesting unsupervised learning rule. And the, the, the idea is to do unsupervised rapid learning of repeating patterns. Okay? And it seems kind of broad, but it, well, I'll, talk, I'll, I'll give you two examples of that that we've, that we've got implemented as well. Let's see how we have time. All right, great. All right, so let's. So I'm going to talk about just this. Give you two examples of this efficient uh, CNN inference component here. All right. So again, so for applications, we're talking object classification, object detection, uh, speech recognition. For training, the idea is you're going to use backprop. Okay, you're going to use backprop. You're going to use uh, some labeled data set with activations um, uh, and sorry, some labeled data set, and you're going to have activation and weight quantization. Because what we do is we're not going to run 32-bit weights on this chip or 32-bit activations on this chip. Okay? We're talking like right now we're looking at 1 to 4-bit activations and weights. Okay? And the thing is uh, our design is flexible, so you can choose what, whatever you want for each layer. Okay? So some layers may you need 1-bit or 2-bit or whatever. We can, we can support enough, so you can choose what you want. So you might think, well, four, that sounds kind of low. Well, let me show you what you can do first, OK? Then, then, we'll, then we'll talk about it. 
All right, and again, so we're, we're focusing. There, there's, there's a benefit to being really specific about what, what you're doing. Um, you don't have to be completely broad. So here's what we, we, we've done. We, we're focusing on feed-forward convolutional neural networks. And the reason is the architecture is really simple. Okay, it's, it's feed-forward. And, and the other benefit is they can do a lot of things. Okay, uh, sure, there's other networks that can do different things that are, that are better suited for different tasks, absolutely. But there's a lot of them that are really, that you can run with CNNs, okay? And so again, the, the purpose here is to run CNN inference on, on, on small, low power devices. And the key tricks that we've used, we're talking about doing event-based convolutions <coughs> and separable convolutions, okay? And so very briefly, uh, event-based convolutions are similar to, it's the same, you get the same output as you would with a normal uh, convolution, only you, only you don't have to move this kind of filter across this whole, this whole input. What you're doing is just taking, as something comes in, you do the effect of that convolution, okay? And so if things are sparse enough, which is a big if, then you can get a power benefit, okay? So that's one, one aspect. The second aspect is this idea of separable convolutions. So remember, a normal convolution, it does something where you're, where you're correlating something in space and across channels at the same time. OK? And all, all separable convolutions are doing, or, or uh, what people have said they're doing, is saying, let me separate this process. OK? So let me do spatial correlation first, and then I'll do channel correlation second in these two discrete steps. And if you do it, then mathematically you can save on computation and parameters. And most of the time it's not exactly equivalent, but it's good enough for a neural network. The neural network can use it just fine to do what it needs, which is create these correlations in space and channels. Okay? All right, so here's our first example. So everyone does MNIST, so we did MNIST and we said we're not gonna talk about it. We do. People, people do MNIST, fine. That's good, we can do MNIST. Let's talk about the next one up, right? CIFAR 10. So what we did is we took a VGG-like network. VGG is, v, is this kind of older neural net, uh, deep neural network. We ran it through something where we quantized it so it had uh, ternary weights, binary activations, okay? And here, let's see if this, there we go. We fit it completely on our chip. Okay, because again, when it's quantized, you can fit a lot of things. And so now we can, let's, let's, this is just this thing, we're pushing it through our chip and it's just, I'm showing you kind of how it's, how it's working. We're getting 92% accuracy about. Um, it can go much faster, but you have to you know, slow it down so everyone can see stuff like this. So, okay, and this was kind of just our first data point in, well, what, what do we have to do? So every, um, one of my uh, points that I'd like to make is, every network you look at, you can learn something from, right? And so, uh, you, obviously, you want to be able to generalize, but you first have to really look closely at, at some networks and, and, and get some uh, uh, insight from them. Uh, this reminds me of at one, of a pre in the previous, one of the previous NICE, nice uh, conferences or workshops, uh, Sebastian Sung was talking about, uh, I think he was studying the, uh, some of the, I think it was retinal cells or eye cells in extreme detail, and you can learn a lot from, from studying these systems in extreme specificity. And that's what we're talking about doing here. So we actually optimized our network based on this, and then we chose another network and did the same, and then we found we could generalize across a bunch, okay? So it's kind of a way of doing research. All right, so this is just kind of what the network, this is kind of the stats of the network. Remember this was a, you know, this is CIFAR 10, so 60K cell, uh, color images, 32 by 32. It's VGG-like. We got top one 92%, and you know, this is what the network looked like. One reason you'd want to use convolution, so here's the total number of weights slash trainable parameters, right? One reason you want to use convolution is because if you do weight sharing, then you're, you pretend, you simulate this many synapses, right? Okay? You don't have that, physically have that, but you, you you're, you're, because you're going across the image, okay? So this is pretty good. C4, C410 is not bad, but what about ImageNet? That's a little bit more challenging, right? This is uh, a common, this is kind of one of the common benchmarks now that DNNs and CNNs use. So we did, we, we took MobileNet, 
which is a, uh, I think Google developed it. Here's, here's the reference for it here. We, we took that network and we trained it and we quantized it down to about four bit weights, four bit activations. And then we took one, one of the layers to be uh, two bit weights, just because we, we, had, we were trying to fit this thing onto this chip, okay? Because remember, we're not going off chip. This is completely on this chip. And so ImageNet's pretty challenging. It's 1.2 million color images, uh, 224 by 224 resolution, 1,000 classes. Um, and we got pretty good. So the network we started out looked like this. The network that is actually on the chip is similar, but definitely not the same. OK? And the original, the original performance for MobileNet was about 70.6%. OK? So, uh, and by the way, we're, we're actually not done optimizing this. This is just where I ended up when I had to leave and come talk to you guys. So we're, we're still going up, OK? So this is, we think this is, this is pretty good because of fitting a mobile net equivalent network on a chip and being able to try to do this low power is pretty, pretty good. So we're, so we're pretty happy with that. Check my, okay, great. All right, and so just really briefly, so here's our, here are some of the things that, that we support on, on our site. We have, um, here's our input convolution. We have standard convolution, point-wise convolution, depth-wise convolution with these kernel sizes and these strides and these convolution types. We have global average pooling, okay? And finally, uh, if you want to save power and, and probably mm, speed as well, uh, you, you want to try to avoid doing multiply accumulates. So if you stay, this is just a little chart saying, look, if you, if you keep one to two bit or one to two bit weights, one to two bit activations, when you do this dot product, this convolutional dot product, you're not going to have any max, OK? Uh, if, even, if one of these goes over 2-bit and the other one stays low, you still won't have any multiply accumulates, because it'll just be like 1 times whatever that is, or 0 times that, or minus 1 times that, or 2, which you can shift as a multiply. So you can do all these tricks. But OK, fine. fine. If, if you have 4-bit weights, 4-bit activations, yeah, you'll do some max. Okay, so it's kind of up to the user to choose how much accuracy they need and how much speed. So that's that's part of this. The point of Akita is we want to allow people to choose. Actually, I only need thirty percent accuracy. Give me something even lower power, or smaller, or faster. Okay, so it's about the, being able to offer these trade-offs. All right, so let's talk about this this the second part. Yes, I was going to skip this one. Okay, good. So. Yeah, so here's where we were before. We are talking about these two different ones. And here's, let's talk about this, this native um, spike neural network stuff. All right. So, so we have a proprietary learning rule that I wish I could talk about more, but I cannot. Um, and, and my friends at CNDA know this because I always talk about SCDP because that's what I wrote my thesis on. Anyway, it's an STDP inspired learning rule. SDP is spike timing dependent plasticity, and it's a learning rule where the weights change depending on the timing of, of the spikes. Okay? And it's unsupervised, okay? That's the that's the key thing. So it includes homeostatic mechanisms, which is, which already I want to say are very, very important because if you've ever played with SDP, you'll know it can quickly go out of whack. You'll either get all your weights to max out or completely go to zero, OK? Um, it includes competition me mechanisms, because with unsupervised learning, you want to provide a mechanism so that things don't all learn this, the same thing, OK? Right? Because you're not doing backprop on these things. So there's, comp there's a competition mechanism built in. And more importantly, it's, it, well, maybe not more importantly, but it's extremely simple and efficient uh, implementation in hardware, so we can do this really fast, OK? and relatively low power. OK, so here's the, here's the thing. This is kind of the different, this is the, a, paradigm, a paradigm shift in, in using the chip. We're talking about what is, it, what, is this thing, what is this learning rule good at? Well, it excels at finding and learning input patterns embedded in noise with very few repetitions. OK, so that's not maybe your typical class, that's not a typical classification problem, right? But if you, can, if you can formulate your problem in this way, 
then you can actually do quite well on, on some pretty cool tasks. And we're talking very few repetitions on average three to five. And we can tweak things so that you can kind of choose how many repetitions on average and on these things. So let me give you a few examples. All right. So we have a, we have a DDS camera. We, we, we taught this thing hand gestures. We used a, a pretty simple, let's say, I think it's about two layer convolutional um, network. We're not doing bad crop. We trained it just by using this unsupervised learning rule. So pretty much you just show it stuff. OK? You're going to show it stuff. And stuff will, and certain patterns will be invariant. So you'll learn those patterns. OK? And so we trained it on one, two, and three. And we're going to show you that it trains pretty quickly for five. OK? So let's see if we play this. All right. And you'll see, let's see here, this cursor go up here. OK, so we're loading the weights for one, two, and three. So these are pre-trained. All right, and then it pops up. It says what it thinks it is. All right, so now we're going to set it to learn. All right. And that's pretty much it. That's all it, that's all it needs. And so now we're going to go back, and it's gonna, we're going to test them. One, two, three, five. It works. OK? And so this is something we haven't actually put a ton of, of, of uh, research into making things invariant and other things. We just wanted to see how well it could do with a relatively simple two-layer convolutional neural network. Again, this is event-based, unsupervised learning. This is what this does. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, that's it. OK, so, so here is here's the other application. So again, remember, it's, it's, how you, it's how you formulate the problem. So uh, we had a cybersecurity application that, our, uh, that some of our scientists work on. I, I wasn't a primary scientist on this one. Um, we're talking about, okay, I should say that we, we have our uh, data to spike converter here. And it takes some tabularized, tabularized data from a PCAP file. Now, I'm not a security person. This is, <laughs> this is pretty much information that tells you about uh, internet traffic and if it's malicious or not. Okay? And so it trains, again, using uh, this unsupervised lear learning rule on the CIC IDS 2017 data set that had about 2.5 million lines corresponding to captured internet traffic with 14 categories of attack using native on-chip learning. It got 97.4% uh, accuracy, which is actually pretty good. Um, they, they were comparing it against other machine learning algorithms, and it was doing as, as well as, as they were. Um, and its training time was 20 minutes per epoch, and they used one epoch. It's kind of weird to say epoch because it's not using backprop or something like this, but epoch is just saying it saw everything once, at least once. Actually, once exactly. So. Let's see here. So here's it's doing its thing. And up bottom left is the top line is benign. And then every once in a while, you'll see it'll, it'll find something, one of, one of these things. Uh, top right are the neur, uh, neuron activations. Uh, bottom right is the confusion matrix. Um, it should be like this to find, to find these things. And so this thing's actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. Oh, and this fits completely on the chip with room to spare. So we're working on trying to make it a lot better and a lot faster. Um, OK, perfect. All right, so just two more quick things. So uh, we have the Akita development environment, which is pretty much, we have two things. The, the develop environment, which is, lets you use it, and then our execution engine, which is a simulation of our chip. OK, so if you want to use this, you can. Download the Akita development environment, which is in Python. You can use pip to install it. It works. It's pretty, it's pretty easy to install. Um, and you can use a really simple API, plus all the tools you already have for data processing in Python. Use those. Okay? And you can run. And what this thing will do is it'll simulate how it runs on the chip. And it'll tell you how much power it'll cost, how many cores on the chip it'll, it'll use, uh, and how much time it'll take. Okay, so you'll know, okay, is this worth using or not? Okay. 
And finally, we have this, uh, for, for converting things from a CNN to SNN, we, we, wrote, we wrote our own CNN to SNN toolbox. Again, this is in Python. It, it has a TensorFlow or a Keras front end for, for TensorFlow um, back end. Yeah, sorry, uh, the Keras is, 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 you can use that as well, but it's, it's really the front end for TensorFlow. Um, and you can use it to quantize your networks and fit it on there. So pretty much what you do is you either use, or, use this, and, and the, the trick is you need to follow the specs saying what's a, what's a key to compatible. So it'll say, can I do a stride of two or, or not? And if not, do I have to do max pooling instead? What do I have to do? So it says very, very concretely, you can do this. Then um, you just run these conversion scripts, and it automatically just makes the, uh, like these weights file and a, and a configuration file for the chip, for the AEE, the, the execution engine, and you can run it. And again, it'll tell you all the stats for everything. So uh, that's kind of where we ended up. And again, this is all in Python and stuff people, most people already know. And that's it. I'm happy to take questions. You say that it all runs all in the chip, but thereby you imply that you're using external memory, aren't you? Uh, no, on-chip memory about, I think I'm allowed to say it's eight, eight megabytes. Yeah. And then, but, oh, but there's, yeah, there's a picture that had external memory as well. And that's for, that's for if something doesn't fit on a chip, you can use external memory. That's, that's true. So your CIFAR examples, they uh, used only the eight megabit. That's chip. right. Okay. And, and the ImageNet examples, too which is even more cha challenging, if you ask a, me. A second question, Matt. Yeah. Um, what is your known model you're using, <laughs> roughly? So Peter, how much am I allowed to say? It's an integrated fire neural model. Yep, it's, 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 it's very simple. It's extre extremely simple. Uh, thanks. I also have two questions, mm -hmm. both about the learning model. Mm -hmm. So you said you have homeostatic mechanism and competition. First, I wonder whether competition is between synapses directly or neurons on the output layer. And both these mechanisms, how local is the learning rule still? Very yes. good question. Um, so for the homeostasis stuff, uh, that's like a local thing. That's, that's, that's a completely local thing. For the competition, that's, a, that's more of a, a global thing. And it's actually more of a user. It's like uh, the user can kind of like say, I want this group to, com to, to compete for this, and I want this group to compete to look at something else. So it's kind of, that's more global. That, that's, that's more global. Um, yeah, I, I guess that's all I can say about, about this, uh, that. Between synapses or neurons? Uh, uh, I guess you could say, let me think for a moment. No, I would say neurons. Yep. And the second question, unsupervised learning. So now it's cute, but I wonder how far do you plan to go with it? Yeah, at yeah. some point, um, I guess would be you would need some kind of supervision, whether it's in the way how you present the data. Sure, or sure. Else. So one way to do it, one way to view it is, can you do unsupervised learning and maybe have like uh, external labeling? Like I discovered what this new thing is, but I don't know what it is. Tell me what, the, what, what I should call it. So like ex some sort of external label, right? So that's one, one way. The other thing that's more, more interesting is, what can you do with a pre-trained network, CNN, you know, pre something that you use with backprop? Can you extend it with unsupervised? And if you can, how far can you go with it? Right. That's a really good question. I agree. I think I think overall you want to you, you want to use both, and that's part of the reason we wanted to do this is we want to use we want to do uh, not compete with DNNs, but kind of like uh, I don't know, extend them with, with with these things. So, great question though. Yeah. Oh, so. Uh, one of the most interesting applications for at least unsupervised learning is uh, time prediction, right? Prediction over time. So, uh, have you guys already run experiments or plan to run experiments? Not just classification and saying, oh, it's five, right. but can you right. try and guess what it's going to say next? Right. That's a really good question. So, um, we have totally been thinking about this. Right now, for this version of the chip, I'm not sure we want to do. Um, Something like a, like a recurrent connection or something some, something like this. However, we can do so so we can group events in a, in a really specific way such that we could, we might be able to integrate time in that way. So that's the thing. So again, I think the the thing to take away is you can create a really simple system 
And because it's so simple, you can end up doing pretty complicated things because it's such a simple thing. You go, oh, OK, I'll just, you know, I, I just have to use one bit instead of this or whatever. It's, it's, I, I'm, I, I came, I joined this project when, when this learning rule was already developed. And so when I came across it, I was like, this seems really simple. Then I played with it. I was like, this is very simple. And I was, <laughs> I was very happy about it. So great question, though. So, so when you're using the TensorFlow workflow, your learning's off board, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I, I, and I should have made that more clear. You train it first using GPUs. You could pay all your money to Amazon, right? <laughs> I have been. It's horrible. Um, and uh, that's what you'll do. And you'll take it, and you'll, t and you put, you'll convert it with our scripts, and then it'll run the inference part without learning. Now, you could put unsupervised learning on that as well, but exactly. OK, I have to ask one more question. Uh, it's going to be science fiction, right? <laughs> no, we can talk about science fiction okay. at supper. OK. Um, how does that compare to William's uh, whetstone oh, the conversion process? I, I, glad you brought this up. So here's the best part. You can use these other things. Like if you're in TensorFlow or whatever, use it. That's fine. Just make sure it's com it, it follows the compatibility things with, with with Akita, and then you can use that converted thing. So you can go from 32-bit activations to uh, one, you know, one-bit activations, and give us those, give it, give us that network, and it'll run. Okay, great. Yeah, great. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, so you could totally use Whetstone. Uh, let's go ahead and thank Chris again. Thanks. <laughs>